Um, my name is Anastasia Lopez, and this is the authentic developer. Although throughout the talk, you can replace developer with designer, product manager, pastry chef, whatever rocks your boat. Um, this is my journey, my story, and that's why I call it the authentic developer, and I will reference it as a developer because that's what I am. Before I start, I always like to give a warning because this is not going to be a technical talk. This is not a talk where I'm going to show code, I'm going to talk about Kotlin or Java or any fancy new things that everyone wants to try. This is a talk about feelings, nothing more than feelings. And I know you might be thinking like, ugh, feelings, really? But I think feelings is what makes us humans. And developers or not, we're still humans. And to be able to rock our job, we need to interact and learn how to interact with humans and just become better. To be a great engineer, to be a great developer, we still have to learn progress as a human being. So that's why I think this talk is important. That's why I'm here. So I'm going to do something that my friend Michael May does in his talks. So I'm just basically stealing his idea. I'm going to ask a series of questions. And if the answer is yes, you have to clap once. Like, don't go, just like, once is enough. If the answer is no, you don't have to do anything. Just like, sit tightly. Does anyone, does everyone understand that? Yay. OK. Have you ever feared that someone would realize that you don't really know what you're doing? Do you avoid writing blog posts or doing talks because you, you think you don't, you don't have anything to say? Do you sometimes shy away from asking questions because you're afraid the question is dumb? Have you ever felt like an imposter? So I do feel like an imposter. I was going to clap, but then the microphone and stuff is very annoying. Um, I, I, I am an imposter. I feel like an imposter. A lot. There are some days that are good. There are some days that are bad. Today wasn't a great day. I'm definitely having imposter syndrome about this talk. But I'm not alone. And for those who clap, for those who didn't clap, you can realize you're not alone either. This is normal. This is common. It's a thing. Um, I'm not just here to talk about imposter syndrome. I'm t I think I see imposter syndrome as um, a side effect of our personalities, of our culture, of toxic behavior. I've, I am here to talk about authenticity and just being able to remove the fear, to remove the imposter syndrome, and just be authentic. Because during my career, I've had several times where I felt someone has figured out that I'm an imposter. And it's been, I can remember then, and they've been painful. Sometimes they were very obvious, as in, you're bad at your job. <laughs> And then sometimes we're very subtle, like not feeling valued at the company or not getting the promotion I wanted or I thought I deserved. And when this happens to me, I have so many feelings. I feel angry, I feel sad, I feel confused. I kind of just want to hide away from the world, from my friends, from everyone. Um, and it hurts. It really, really does hurt. So after one of these events, I wanted to well, one of these situations, after I recovered, I wanted to understand what was happening. Because it's not nice. I just went into like what I call the imposter syndrome loop, where I don't feel value, and then I told myself, it's because you're not good, and then I don't feel value, and blah, 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 blah. And I wanted to stop that. I wanted to get out of that loop. I didn't want it to happen ever again. So I started investigating, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's how this journey began. And the journey begins with shame. We associate shame with like that embarrassment, especially like when you're, we're teenage, teenagers in high school, and we feel all of our insecurities. Everything's an insecurity. Like, oh my god, I cannot believe my crush saw me with avocado in my teeth. Bad example. I would have never eaten avocado, but I think you get the gist. The thing is, we still experience shame as an adult, but because we're an adults, our insecurities are just more rooted in us, and it hurts even more. These are all quotes of people I've talked to about shame. Some of them feel very obvious, like, you know, my boss calling me an idiot at work. Some of them are very subtle, very personal. But they all tell a similar story. We experience shame when we believe we're flawed, when we believe we're imperfect. And because of that, we believe we're unworthy of belonging or just being accepted. We believe that we're unworthy of being accepted just as we are. We're afraid and sometimes terrified that people will think that we're not funny enough, techy enough, geeky enough, smart enough, that we're just simply not enough. We're afraid that what we have to offer to the world isn't enough. 
So what we do, we just hide our authentic version of ourselves in like layers of decorations of characteristics, personality traits that aren't really us. For me, shame is the little voice in my head telling me I'm not enough. Asking me, who do you think you are? What knowledge are you here to share? To share? I like to, see, uh, to think about it like a little person in my head because I need to understand it. It's there for a reason. It just didn't appear overnight. And just like the Joker, if you want to stop it, you need to understand its plan, its motivation, and its pattern to be able to stop it. Because that voice, at the moment, when it performs an attack, when I feel shame, it comes with just so many overwhelming feelings. Anger, sadness, confusion, wanting to run away and hide from the world. Someone, um, we're afraid that someone is going to find out we're not good enough. We're afraid of being vulnerable. Now, vulnerability is what we're uncertain about. It's that feeling we have when we take risks or where we're emotionally exposed. And we have situations where we feel vulnerable almost every day of our lives. And vulnerability has a terrible image in society. And as tech people, it has like the worst image in the world. We associate vulnerability with weakness. We don't want our code to be vulnerable, so obviously we cannot be vulnerable. It's just like logic, right? So we don't want to expo expose our vulnerabilities. We don't want to take risks. We don't want to do talks. We don't want to do blog posts. We just want to stay in our comfort zone so no one can see our vulnerabilities or weaknesses and exploit them. And if someone does expose us, if someone does re realize we have a weakness, we feel shame. They've discovered us. We're flawed. As I said, experiencing vulnerability happens almost daily. It is not a choice. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. The choice we have is how to react when we face it. We can react with shame, which is a normal reaction. We can feel defensive. We can lie. Or we can just embrace it. The choice I want you to make after this talk is to embrace vulnerability. Embrace that naked feeling, that uncertainty. Do talks, do blog posts, go ask questions, go talk to people. Just embrace your authentic self. I think by now you've joined the dots. What I was talking about before I started talking about shame, it was shame. What I was experiencing was shame. And knowing that this has a name and other people experience it was really, really helpful for me. So the next step I took was to understand my own shame because we're all different. Everyone has a different shame. Everyone has different weaknesses. Everyone is completely different. But my first step, or the second step, I suppose, was to understand my own shame. And I'm going to drink water because I'm thirsty. This is not awkward. OK. <laughs> um, I want to be more authentic, and that's why I wanted to understand my, voice, my shame, understand the little voice in my head so I can know where it's coming from. The way I did it was with this exercise from Brene Brown. If you haven't heard from her about her, go. She's really, really good, and she talks about shame and vulnerability much better than me, and she's awesome. Um, but anyway, I use this exercise. It's called identifying your shame triggers. The idea is that first, you write the things you want to be perceived as. I'm going to use myself as a real life example when I did this. You can do this whenever you want. You can do it now or at work. But just don't tell your boss I told you to do this uh, in your commute, in your bike. And you can do it in any, every, every aspect of your life. Right now, I'm going to use myself as an example and just my career-wise, like just my developer part. When I did this, I wrote down, I want to be perceived as a good speaker. I want to be perceived as a good developer. I want to be perceived as tough, but nice and kind. I want to be perceived as a ninja, ninja developer. After you write this down, you then write the things you don't want to be perceived as. Again, for me, I didn't want to be perceived as not taking enough, as dumb, or as emotional and soft. Once you write this down, you don't even have to write it down, you can memorize it. But once you've realized this, you try to understand where are they coming from. And here's a series of questions you can ask, like, where are these expectations coming from? How realistic are they? Can you be all those things at the same time? Am I describing who I want to be or who society wants me to be? Um, and if someone does find out that you know I'm one of those unwanted personas, what will really happen? Because we've seen we feel shame, 
But now we know shame is in our, our, all in our heads. Like, if someone sees me as dumb, the world will continue. I will feel hurt, but if I know how to control my shame and I know what's happening, really, nothing is happening if someone just perceives me as dumb. When I started asking these questions around my, oh, sorry, I'm not good. When I started asking these questions around my shame triggers, I realized that being wanted to be a ninja developer was actually coming from our industry because we have this idea that you have to be a good developer, you have to breathe and sweat code all the time, that you have to code even when you're sleeping, and obviously I wasn't doing that. So that's why that's where ninja developer was coming. And then I also realized I had contradictions. I cannot be nice and kind and yet not be perceived as emotional. If I want to empathize with people, if I want to help people, I need to be, feel my emotions to be able to connect with them. And also, I could never be a ninja developer. I'm so clumsy and loud, like, it wouldn't happen. So that was my first step, understanding my own shame, understanding the little voice in my head. Where is she coming from? She's a she. We're best friends now, kind of, sometimes. Just understanding why is she there and how she learned all these things. Most of them are society or just our own punishment that we inflict on ourselves. So the second step I took was to figure out the things that block me from being authentic. The first one, stop trying to fit in and start belonging because there is a difference. Fitting in is becoming whoever the situation wants you to, needs you to be, while belonging is just being yourself at all times. We are often so worried about what people think and so overwhelmed of trying to be who they need us to be that we just lose ourselves. We forget who we are, what we value, what, we re what our authentic self is. But we don't have to. We have to stop that. Because we, don't, we cannot give people what we don't have. We cannot be what we are not. This took a lot of practice. I'm still, obviously, a work in progress. Um, there's lots of years of bad habits of me trying to be whoever my parents, my sister, my, my brother, my friends, my coworker, my community wanted me to be, and just I forgot who really I am. Um, so it takes a lot of practice and self-reflection, and I think self-reflection is very, very hard, and you can ask any therapist in the world, it's really hard. But as any skill, if you practice it, you can accomplish it, you can get better at it. The way I started this was just writing down who I want to be, who my authentic self is. Not who my parents want me to be, not who the ninja developers want me to be, just who I want to be. And that will help me define my actions, make decisions better. When I see myself falling in old patterns, like for example, if I hear a comment that's not very nice and you know, maybe it's racist or homophobic, and I'm questioning like, ah, oh, should I say something? I don't want everyone to think that I'm that person or I don't want everyone to hate me. I remember I actually want to be a person that speaks out and that will carry on my action. I will actually speak out. Of course, this is not perfect. Of course, at the beginning and still I make so many mistakes and I just fall into bad habits. I, t I let the little voice in my head take control and it just goes so fast. You don't even notice it until after it happens. But that's still okay. As long as you can reflect back and say, I shouldn't have done that. It's fine. Mistakes will, are going to happen anyway, so we might as well embrace them. I try not to, I try to stop fitting in to let my authentic self come out. I am not just my work. The same as this cat is not just Batman, it's a super cat, it's like a has real cat's responsibilities. And you're also not your work. As developers, it's very, very easy to get attached to our code. I know I'm creepy, but I still call some of my apps my babies. Yes, creepy, I know. But I've worked so hard on them. I put so much time and effort and sweat and tears. I sometimes put my life on hold for them, so they kind of feel my, like my babies. I do not have babies, so you know, for me, that's it. And it's normal to get attached to yourself to a code. But I've noticed that we not only attach ourselves to our code, but we also attach our self-worth to it. And that shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't perceive our self-worth or like attach our self-worth of how our pull requests or our code or our talks are perceived. Because what we do is if the Twitter has likes and retweets, if the blog post has medium claps, if the pull request goes through smooth like a cruise, we're fine, we're good, we're worth it. But 
if, on the contrary, we do not get any medium claps, if no one likes our, pull, our blog post, if the pull request actually has a lot of comments, we're just feeling our little voice saying, I knew it, you're actually faking it, you're bad, you're an imposter. It's normal to get attached to yourself to the code. It's normal to want the respect and admiration from your peers. But our self-worth should never, ever be in the table. So that's my reminder. A reminder to take more risks, take more chances, to break things, to try new things. And whatever happens, you're still going to be enough. You're still going to be good enough. You're still going to be worth it. When I see I'm second guessing myself again, when I think no one's going to come to my talk and people are going to boo me or throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> I still, well, I'm still here. I still remind myself that even if no one likes a talk, even if no one comes, even if you ruin my dress with tomatoes, I'm still going to be okay. I'm still going to be worth it. I'm still to Chris and even more and even becoming more authentic because I'm doing what I love. I try not to, well, I try not to let my attention to my work stop me from being authentic. Criticism. We need to learn how to filter criticism. The internet is a wonderful place where I found most of these images. There are cat gifs and there are videos of dog pool parties. There is, it's wonderful. But it can be horrible and terrible at the same time. When we're taking these risks and we're exposing ourselves to the world, we're exposing ourselves to trolls, and there are so many. There are so, so many trolls. There are Twitter trolls, there are GitHub trolls, there are Instagram trolls, there are all the trolls. Any troll that you can imagine, they're going to be in the internet. We just need to learn how to filter that criticism. We don't even need to expose ourselves in the internet to get these trolls. At work, we might get criticism from coworkers that don't really care about us, nor want us to improve. They're just trolls. We need to learn how to only listen to criticism from the people who really care about us, who really understands us, who wants us to improve, to be better. There's an American expression that I've never really, really used in real life. I've only seen it in movies that says, talk to the hand because the face isn't listening. I really like it. I really hope people actually use it in America. But that's what I do. When I when I hear a criticism that's going to affect me, like, you're dumb, you're not taking enough, you're a bad developer, I try to imagine like a hand block and saying that. I acknowledge the criticism, ignoring it is not going to take me anywhere, but I just don't let it affect me. Shockingly, that sometimes doesn't work. The criticism bypasses my imaginary hand block, and it does affect me. And I feel shame, or I just spiral into the imposter syndrome loop. And that's when I triggered Plan B. Now, Plan B has a lot of steps that I couldn't. I wanted to add slides yesterday, but there were too many, and I don't have enough time. Uh, but the main focus of, my, of Plan B was finding and talking to my support network. I defined my support network. I already had it. I just wrote down the people I, really, I can really trust, and I go talk to them. I ask them for help. I ask them for the opinion. I ask them for help again. And they help me get out of the imposter syndrome loop. If you don't think you have a support system, or yeah, support system, you probably do. If you don't know or you want to figure out how to do it or you want more recommendations on how to exit the imposter syndrome loop, just come talk to me afterwards. I, maybe I'll do another talk about it, I don't know, but it's too long to explain here. Another thing I'm trying to do is stop being a people pleaser. <laughs> it's hard. Um, before, still sometimes, whenever I would receive criticism, I would try to convince them to like me or convince them why they're wrong. And it would just be exhausting because I would waste so much energy and at the end, nothing, I wouldn't see the benefit of it. I heard a phrase from the author of marketing, so it's Scott Stratton, that says, don't try to win over the haters, you're not the jackass whisperer. It's brilliant. So now I choose my battles. I choose the people who I really want to impress, who I really want them to like me sometimes because I care for them, but not by changing myself, just by exposing myself and being vulnerable. I try not to let the haters stop me from being authentic, stop, the, stop them from getting in my head. I really want to improve, I want to be better, but only the people who I trust and who care about me will help me get there. I, I am not perfect, and I'm going to break it to you. Really sorry, you're not perfect either. And that is okay, <laughs> it's perfectly fine. 
I've noticed we're always striving for perfection, to write the most perfect code, to be perfect, to be the perfect woman, to be the perfect man. So I want to do the clapping thing again. If it's yes, clap. If it's no, do nothing, nada, silence. Do you believe in the perfect code? Oh. <laughs> it's OK. You'll learn. <laughs> There is no such thing as perfection. I'm going to break it now. And there is definitely no such thing as a perfect code. And the same way we've learned that there is no such thing as a perfect code. And if you haven't, don't worry. You one day will realize that everything is fake and we're just living in an imperfect world. We need to learn how to not put that pressure on ourselves. We need to learn how to not, choose not to choose perfection over us. We need to choose improvement over perfection. We need to choose to become better and learn rather than perfection. Mistakes don't and won't define us because mistakes are just part of life. They're just going to happen whether we like it or not. So we just need to learn how to fail and how to recover and just choose ourselves over perfection. To try to remove this perfection myth, I said reasonable, reachable goals. Because perfection is a little voice in my head telling me, or putting goals on reachable goals or just like high standards that I'm never going to reach. So I do the opposite. I try to put reasonable, reachable goals. Ninja developer. What is that? <laughs> like, does it mean that you're going to do karate and a developer or you're going to be an martial, martial arts and developer? And what does expert developer mean? So you define what you actually want to become. I want to become an engineering manager in the next two years, for example. And that's my goal. Or a smaller one, I want to improve my French two levels in two months. So I set actions and I go about life. Sometimes, obviously, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to learn or I don't make my goals. And that is still fine. I'm still learning. If I don't learn two, language, two levels of French in two months, I know it's not enough time. So I can say, OK, two levels of French in three months. I will have improved because, again, mistakes will happen. I just need to learn from them, and that's fine. I try to stop unrealistic standards or goals from bringing me down and stopping from being more authentic. Now, we've looked how we stop ourselves, we block ourselves of being authentic by trying to fit in, trying to be perfect, putting our self-worth in our work, or just letting the trolls in our head. But how can we amplify our authenticity? How can we become even more authentic? There's this definition by Dean H. Hepworth, Ronald H. Rooney, and Jane Lawson that defines authenticity as the sharing of self by relating in a natural, sincere, spontaneous, open, and genuine matter. These are all skills we can practice every day or once a week, whatever your choice. You can wake up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror, make eye contact with yourself, and say, today I'm going to be open. Today I'm going to be genuine. I do not know if you talk to yourself like that in the mirror. Maybe you should try. We can just practice these skills. They're just skills that we can just practice every day, once a week, or whatever. Besides that, there are a couple of things we can do as well. To start, to be more authentic, we need to treat ourselves like the way we treat the people we love, as long as we treat them with kindness, obviously. <laughs> we need to treat ourselves with empathy and understanding. We are our harshest critic. That little voice in our head is our harshest critic. So we need to learn self-compassion. Having compassion in ourselves is not that hard to having compassion to the people we care about. Instead of judging or criticizing ourselves for various inadequacies, we just need to treat ourselves with understanding when confronted with personal failings. And now self-compassion has three elements. Common humanity. We have to be warm and understanding to ourselves whenever we fail or we make mistakes, rather than ignoring the pain or just punishing ourselves with criticism. We've already learned we're not perfect, and that failing is part of life. It's going to happen. So we have to accept that reality with kindness and sympathy. Frustration and not having things go the way we thought they were going to go comes, often comes associated with an irrational feeling of isolation, as if I were the only one suffering, if, as if I were the only one making mistakes. I am the only one with imposter syndrome. <laughs> But as we saw in the beginning, we are not. We all suffer. We are all vulnerable and imperfect. So self-compassion involves recognizing that suffering is part of our shared human experiences, something we all go through. 
Self-compassion also involves learning to deal with our negative emotions so that they're neither suppressed nor amplified. So here comes mindfulness. Mindfulness is a non-judgmental mind state in which one observes thoughts and feelings as they are without trying to suppress them or trying to deny them. We cannot ignore our pain and feel compassion about it at the same time. But it also requires not obsessing about it and getting caught on this negative reaction and negative emotions. Self-compassion is a skill, it's a set of skills. This webpage has a lot of resources and exercises and meditation and mindful exercises that you can practice. Self-compassion means retraining the little voice in your head. We already know why it's there. We already know where it's come from. It's learned bad habits. We just need to retrain it so they're kind and empathetic towards us. Dr. Kristen Neff, uh, associate professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, says that the number one barrier of self-compassion is the fear of being complacent and losing your edge. I definitely had that. I remember talking to someone and saying, I cannot remove that little voice in my head because that's what push, pushes me to be better. That's what pushes me to be kinder. Like, if I don't have that voice, I'm just gonna become Donald Trump, and I don't want that. <laughs> Turns out, I don't need to remove it. I just need to re-educate it. Because there's a bunch of studies, I have them listed here, but I cannot be bothered, I'm sorry. But there's a lot of studies, and researchers have found out that self-compassion leads to great personal improvement. So we just, if we retrain that little voice in our head, we're actually gonna become better. We're gonna be better at our jobs. We're gonna live happier lives. And finally, this. I said I was learning French. I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't have the throat that makes those sounds. But in Japanese, it's called ikigai. Ikigai. I know how to say that. What that means is just finding your purpose. What motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? And it can be one or several reasons. Sorry, I'm just muting this because I remember it's not. Um, it, just the purpose that gets you out of bed and go to work in the morning. This is up to you, really. I can put myself as an example, but this is just your journey and your path to find. I love technology. I love working on Android, but the, my ikigai, it's actually people. If it's the end users that are gonna use my application, whatever the product I'm using, I care for them. Or my coworkers, or this lovely Android community, I care for this community, and I want people to be happy in all these aspects. So that's my ikigai. That's why I strive for, that's why I wake up in the morning. So now we've seen that we can, you know, help to become more authentic. We've seen how to become even more authentic, now we can start helping other people become more authentic. And we're gonna start with two things that are very, very, very common, common in the tech industry. You don't use Kotlin, you don't know what Rx Java means, you don't know what a cat is. This is literally shaming the other person, like shoving them, like shoving them into shame. And we're not really getting out anything out of it. We're just shaming them for not knowing a technology. This type of question is really, really common in our industry. The first time you might have heard it, you might have felt shame. You might have got defensive. You might have even lied, like, oh yeah, of course I know what Kotlin is. But then we just get used to it. We start becoming resilient, and then we start doing it ourselves. We need to stop this bad practice, because it's not helping anyone. If you want that person to know what Kotlin is, what Aris Java is, or whatever technology you're talking about, teach them. <laughs> Just explain it to them. And if you're really that passionate that they should start using them, just convince them. Just don't push them into shame. The second one is cold reviews. This is like a famous comic strip that has gone around Twitter a lot. Yes, we know we shouldn't attach our self-worth to our code. We've learned that. But we are part of a very privileged group that only know that. Not everyone knows that. And besides, even if we know that, that doesn't give us the right to behave like jerks. Each code review can be a learning opportunity. Don't make assumptions. Don't try to guess what the person was thinking. Try to gather the context, try to ask questions. If you don't understand any, something or you really cannot understand what the person was doing, just text them or Slack them or talk to them and ask them, do you mind sitting with me so we can go over your pull request? Assume everyone is doing the best they can with the information and context they have. Just because they didn't use X doesn't mean they didn't want to. Maybe they didn't know it existed. 
we can stop blocking people from being their authentic selves by helping them, not by shaming them. Both of these cases have two things in common. First, be nice, don't be a jerk. And second, empathy. I really wish, every time I say empathy, I wish there was a chorus behind me that would be like, ah. <laughs> I really value empathy. I even have an empathy tattoo. I think it's one of those skills that for me is really, really hard to practice, but I want to do it. I want to be better. It's really hard to practice empathy because it, you have to put yourself in other people's shoes. And we're all different, and we all struggle different way. So reaching that point is really hard. I didn't just want to talk to about empathy and just leave it there. So I looked to like actionable things we can, in which we can practice empathy. And I came across Theresa Weisman for empathy attributes. See the world as other people see it. As I say, put yourself in other people's shoes. We all have different brains, priorities, suffering, stories. We all have different lives. When someone opens up to us and tells us their problems, what we usually do is try to put their problem in our world. Like, my, my feet are hurting because of my shoes. Okay, I can relate to that because I've experienced that, and that's great. But sometimes we can't because we haven't experienced it or because we really, it's just a different life, it's just a different struggle. So we just need to understand their problem in their own world, understand what makes it their problem. And to do this, we have to be non-judgmental. It's hard. The moment we start comparing their problem with our own, the moment we think, oh, that's nothing, I have four, more, four kids and I have so many problems, we're already judging them. We're already invalidating those feelings. So we have to try hard not to judge them. You can use mindfulness again, because we've been trained to judge as a society. You can see the, judge, the judgment coming in, you can acknowledge it and just move on. Don't let it stop you or affect you from listening to this person. Because listening is the only way you can, are going to reach the understanding the other person's feelings. You have to listen very, very hard. Listening without interrupting. Listening without coming up with a solution before they even finish. Listening without proposing a solution if you're not asked for. Sometimes the person only needs to vent. Listening in the sense of just putting your whole attention to that person. Finally, now that we understand how that person feels and why this is a struggle, we need to communicate that we understand it and we know they're suffering. We're really not practicing empathy. We're saying, no, nah, that's nothing. We're dismissing their feelings. No one has the right to do that. We all have the right of owning those feelings. Like Those feelings are there for a reason. We're also responsible in acting on those feelings, obviously. If you're angry, you're responsible in not punching someone. But if you're angry, you're allowed to be angry. That's a valid feeling. No one has the right to tell us that our feelings are not valid. So let's not be the person that tells the other person that they, what they're feeling is not valid. To communicate this, just think what you would like to listen. Sometimes it's just a hug. Sometimes it's just saying, I understand. Do you want to talk more? Just try to think what you would like to hear, and then just do it. We can practice empathy by practicing these skills. It's hard, but we can get there. It will also help us help other people. Because as I said, we all have different troubles. Once we start practicing empathy, before people are open to us and vulnerable to us, we can already detect what their struggle is, and we can help them. We can avoid their pain by just trying to help them. If we see, for example, an old woman with, or an old man carrying shopping um, bags very heavy, we know they're suffering because age and they're struggling for, with the weight, probably. In my version, they're like very old and weak, sorry. So we can go out of our way and help them. This is obviously a real life scenario, not very Android, Android or techy. But I'm going to go through some ways you can help people in your workplace. And mainly it's like speaking out. You have a wonderful, powerful voice, so use it. Don't be afraid. Some people will listen, and some people won't. And that doesn't matter. You still are allowed, and you should use it. You can be heard. Someone will listen to it. And when I mean speak out, I don't mean criticize. Again, I don't mean act like a jerk. If you want someone to improve, you have to give a constructive feedback, something actionable that the other person can go back and improve upon, saying, 
your code is poop. Doesn't really help anyone because what is a person gonna do? Like, okay, I don't know, how can I improve my code? Why is it poop? You can say your code is not great because it's not separated or it's very dependent. The person can understand and can go change his code. And when you don't know if, yes, if you don't know if you should speak out or criticize, don't. <laughs> you have to take responsibility of what you say. If you wouldn't say it to a person in real life to their face, don't say it. You have, we have to start owning what we say and take responsibility of it. Even when we make a mistake and we say something we shouldn't and we recognize it, it's never too late to practice empathy and go back and apologize to that person. It is never really too late. One of the things that you can speak out is watching for the culture. It is, I see a culture like, the culture like a very delicate state. And as soon as you start introducing shame behaviors, it just can fall so easily, so fast. I've seen it happen. Sometimes it is very subtle, and sometimes it's very, very obvious. Um, you, so you have to look out for blaming, name calling, uh, harassing, favoritism, criticism. As I name them, you might be thinking, oh, well, yeah, that's not happening to me because it's very obvious, right? Harassing. But if you're not in the receiving end of those things, of those shaming behaviors, they're not very obvious to you. You have to actually look for them. And you have the power to stop them. You have the power to protect your culture. If shaming behavior starts introducing itself to our culture, the people affected are just trying, are gonna start disengaging with the work, disengaging with the teamwork or the team because it's just a survival instinct. They have to protect themselves. And that just leads to worse culture and worse products actually. So you have to make sure you can help these people that are being affected. Help make sure the culture doesn't suppress their authenticity. Another great way you can do a work is just lead by example. As I said, you're a privileged group of people with a lot of knowledge about vulnerability, so you can go to work and embrace that vulnerability. For me, one of like, the biggest struggles that I had when I started was saying, I don't know, because I thought I was you know, not good enough and proving everyone that I actually didn't know what was happening. So by embracing saying, I don't know, it's just grabbing vulnerability by its horns. Say I don't know at work so people feel empowered to follow your example and be more vulnerable, become more authentic. If you're vulnerable, if you're honest about your flaws and the things you don't know and the things you can improve, other people will follow the example and you will create a team of vulnerable people. And once you've reached that, it means you've reached a, a, a state where your team just trusts each other and respect each other. That's a great culture, that's so valuable. So start by saying, I don't know. There is this thing called survivorship bias. It's a bias, so it's very unconscious. We don't know we're doing it. But basically, we think, or our brain, some part of our brain thinks that just because we went through it, everyone else has to go through it. It's just how it goes, right? But there are sometimes there are practices or processes that will trigger shame to people, or they're just simply shaming. That makes us feel like an imposter and frauds. So speak out. Call on them, question them. You have the right to, to question the status quo. A good example is how we treat interns. I've never been treated badly as an intern, but I know stories where we just treat interns as the errand person that go get coffee and make photocopies. But you did it, they treated you like that, and you are there, so it means we can continue doing it. No, this is not a good process. We can change them. Just think about what you would have liked to be treated as. Like you, would, you wanted to learn, you wanted to improve, you wanted to learn this amazing world of Android, not just make coffee, so you can change this process. Another good one is hiring. Sometimes we just copy the hiring process of other big companies because you know it works for them. But does it really work for our company? There are hiring processes which are just shaming. Sometimes the interviewer just wants to prove you wrong and you survived that, and you got hired, so basically everyone has to do it? Again, no. Try to figure out what's the best process for you and your company. What's a process that's not shaming? What's a process that people can actually shine and bring their authentic selves to the table? You're still allowed to question your, you're still 
allowed to question every process in your company, so go for it. If it's not working, you can change it. Normalize the learning discomfort, because learning is uncomfortable, shocking, I know. It's challenging and exciting, but it can be also very uncomfortable, especially when you're insecure of yourself. When you have that little voice in your, in your head saying, don't do it, don't get out of your comfort zone, you're gonna fail so hard, don't learn Kotlin, no, no, no. So normalize discomfort, learning discomfort at work by sharing your own experience. How long did you actually learn, take, how long did it actually take you to learn Kotlin or Rx Java or figure out constraint layout, whatever it is. Don't lie, obviously, but just try to normalize discomfort, with, especially with junior people. Let them know that it's okay to struggle, that it is okay that you were there and you empathize with them. Let them know that it is okay to ask questions, that they can approach you and you will just help them figure it out. Silence their inner voice by telling them it's normal. Normalizing discomfort with your own story is basically sharing your own story, you know, sharing your story. When we tell our story, we change the world. So share your story. Just go out there and explain your struggles. Explain what you're worried about, how it felt becoming into the, be learning to be an under developer, or how it felt to learn Arisaba, or how does it feel to be like, uh, to feel like an imposter. There are stories we're ashamed or afraid to say. That's okay. I don't want to make you do anything you're un super uncomfortable with, just a little bit uncomfortable. It's okay if you feel very uncomfortable and you don't want to tell that experience. Just recover, heal, protect yourself. Maybe you will be able to tell it one day. We've seen in a lot of industry how just one strong voice has this snowball effect where everyone starts speaking out and telling their own experience, their own story. You can be that powerful, strong voice telling this experience, and everyone can open up and share their experience too. Remember when you didn't know what imposter syndrome was and the relief you felt knowing that you were not alone? Try to help people by doing that. Help people become more authentic by telling them your own story and your own experience in becoming more authentic. Because if you remember the definition of authenticity, it has been sincere and open. We have to practice being sincere and open to be more authentic, and we will help people become more authentic with them. You have the power to make a difference. You have the power to overcome your imposter syndrome and become more authentic. And what's even better, you have the power to help people overcome their own imposter syndrome and become more authentic. So go out there, be brave, be vulnerable. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's off. I'm gonna take a selfie. <laughs> Yay. I've never done that, so I thought it was time. <laughs> Thank you, that was an original self. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? We have two microphones in the middle. Uh, so it was a very really nice talk. Thank you. Um, so uh, all the thing about uh, empathy, uh, your story and uh, self-compassion talks about self. So the problems start with self, thinking about yourself. So can we put everything into one slide and say be selfless? So, it's, so when you wake up in the morning, so you think about how can I help others and live for others? Uh, I, think that's, I think that's a good second step for me. I'm not saying I was a horrible human being before, but I feel you have to be strong and compassionate with yourself and understanding with yourself, and then you can really reach understanding and empathy towards others. And I do agree, selflessness at work and in your community and in your life is great, and that's what we should all do. But if we're not doing it to ourselves, we, we're, we're just not gonna do it to anyone else. Okay, thank you. <laughs>